Elvira, mistress of the dark here. You know, I like to think of myself as a gal of many talents. At least, that's what I've been told. Thanks, fellas. But even my list of accomplishments looks about as pale as Dracula working the day shift when I check out our next guest. Let's see, he's a special effects expert, a magazine publisher, a memorabilia collector, and Hollywood's go-to guy when they need someone to play a gorilla. I can only be talking about one man, Bob Burns. There's only one place on Earth where mischievous Martians, crustaceous creatures, angry apes, and time-traveling transportation all live together. You can find them all in the home of film fan, creature creator, and monster movie historian, Bob Burns. When I was a little kid, I mean, really a little kid, maybe five, six years old, I, I liked movies. Even then, I didn't know what they were, I don't think, but I, I loved to see them on the screen. They were really cool. There'd be a big gorilla running around or something. And, and some of the horror movies kind of scared me. I'd be the kid behind the chair looking like that once in a while, or this bit, you know, as all kids did, I think. Growing up in the shadow of Hollywood's greatest dream factories didn't hurt either. Especially when Bob visited a friend's dad at work. Ellis Berman happened to be a prop maker uh, for the movies. He had made the original cane head for the Wolfman movie. It was about this big, and it had like a, a star on it with a wolf, and it had a wolf's head on it. It was supposed to be silver. And Lon Chaney Jr. buys this in the beginning of the film, and you don't realize how essential this prop is to the movie, because at the end of it, his father beats him to death with it. It's silver, and that's what'll kill a werewolf. After visiting the set of producer George Powell's sci-fi classic, Destination Moon, 13-year-old Bob decided to create his own movies. His first magnum opus was titled, The Monster. Now here again, there were no real makeup books or anything, videotapes like there are today. I mean, you can, you know, a guy can learn makeup stuff today incredibly well. Back in the 50s, there was nothing. I just had to make it up, and I thought, what could I do to do this crinkly thing, you know? I, I couldn't think of anything else, and all of a sudden, I, I can't even tell you why this hit me. What about lettuce? Lettuce is flexible. You could glue that on with spirit gum, and I bet it would work. Well, that's exactly what I did. Bob's first movie was such a success at the local camera club, the fledgling filmmaker tackled a second project, The Alien. In 1952, Bob found a lifelong partner and fellow monster fan when he met Kathy Patterson. They married a few years later. Then in 1955, Bob met a Hollywood creature creator who would change his life, Paul Blaisdell. Paul said, well, I'm... I'm building a monster for a movie. And I said, monster? Wait a minute, it got my attention right away. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a puppet for a, a, a Roger Corman. I didn't know who Roger Corman was at that time. Uh, a little film called The Beast with a Million Eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, God, this seems to have a million eyes. It's going to be cool. And he says, no, 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 no. This is the slave puppet of The Beast with a Million Eyes. Beast with a Million Eyes is a mind thing that can take over all of these animals and stuff. That's why they say The Beast with a Million Eyes. Said, but this is the slave of it that's going to try to come out of the ship at the end and get all the people. And since they have no money to work with, I'm just building a little puppet to about, you know, two feet tall or something. And boy, I, but I was still excited about that. In 1963, Bob decided to add a little monkey business to his life. One day, Kathy and I were sitting around. I said, you know, I would like to do a gorilla suit. And she said, oh, sure, I'll just go right down and get a gorilla pattern. You know, well, there weren't any. And so I, I knew Don Post Sr. real well, who did, had the best mask in, in, well, in the world at that time, the rubber mask that he made. The first one was the Glenn Strange Frankenstein in 1948, and that's the one I rode home on my bicycle on. I was so thrilled with that one. I uh, got a few weird looks, I'll tell you. I commissioned him to build the head for me, to do the head. So Kathy got a clown pattern, actually to clown because they're kind of full and everything. And she built the suit actually uh, off of a clown pattern, which worked really pretty good. And we had a rubber chest that, that Don made that we put in it, and, and Kogar was born. Burns spent much of the next 10 years with this monkey on his back, performing on TV, in movies, at amusement parks, and in parades. In the early 1970s, 
Future Oscar winner Rick Baker re-sculpted Bob's ape face to create a more scintillating simian. This happier gorilla was just what the producers of a new TV series, Ghostbusters, were looking for. The 1975 Saturday morning show starred Larry Storch, Forrest Tucker, and a familiar looking monkey. Mark Richards, who created and wrote the show, said, what would you do if you were Tracy the Grill? How, how would you try to, you know, be a human if you were? And I tried to think of something. I thought, oh, man, this is a make it or break it thing here. So I thought, and I, so I, I looked at, there was a desk and a chair there. I went over and there was a copy of the variety. I picked that up, sat in a chair, crossed my leg the way I normally sit anyway, and started reading it. And all of a sudden, Mark Richards said, there's Tracy the Gorilla. Three days later, we're shooting the show. And the greatest experience I've ever had in my whole life. Bob's monkey suit also starred in one of the elaborate Halloween shows that Bob and his colleagues staged over a 30-year period. Did you see that? He's afraid of the authorities. Stick. Did you see that? Did you, did you see that? I'll tell you again. He's so afraid of this, he knows that this is what makes him do as he's told. Look at that. We were blessed with many, many great friends, and a lot of them happened to be, uh, well, now are the top special effect people in the industry. Then they were just teenage kids. You had Rick Baker, Dennis Murin, uh, Bob and Denny Skotek, uh, so many, so many people, it's hard to name them. Bob and Kathy's first Halloween show featured the Frankenstein monster, and even Glenn Strange himself stopped by for a photo op and some goodies. It wasn't long before Bob and his friends started pushing the Halloween envelope. There were spaceships and space invaders, even an elaborate tribute to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. For the good doctor's famous transformation, Bob used an old but effective lighting technique. One of Byrne's biggest shows was a terrific tribute to the War of the Worlds. The show's centerpiece was a 30-foot-long spaceship that seemed to have crashed into the side of Bob and Kathy's home. One show based on the movie Forbidden Planet starred Robbie the Robot himself. Art director Mike Miner's set model was a perfect recreation of the movie's famous setting on Altair IV. The centerpiece of Bob's 1976 celebration was the actual time machine built for George Powell's 1960 feature. For this tribute to The Exorcist, Bob's pal Rick Baker turned heads with this recreation of Dick Smith's chilling makeup from the movie. In 1979, the crew tackled another blockbuster movie by unleashing the star of Alien. The following year, Bob and Kathy took visitors down the Amazon to meet the creature from the Black Lagoon. Effects artist Bill Malone created a suit that was so dead-on accurate, even one of the creature's original performers, Ben Chapman, mistook the costume for one of his own. Over the years, Bob's personal collection of classic memorabilia has grown to monstrous proportions. His collection now includes more than 1,000 pieces. Among Bob's prized possessions are the original armature of King Kong, Glenn Strange's headpiece from Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, and this mask created by makeup master Jack Pierce for The Mummy's Curse. After more than half a century, Bob Burns continues to inspire new generations of monster movie buffs. But Bob's not only been a witness to horror history, 
He's made it himself. I've had the, I guess, the monster feeling, or what do you want to call it, or the, you know, the, the, the urge to do all this stuff and everything since I was just a little teeny kid. I mean, I'm just a guy that's about as lucky as you can get. I'm just a lucky kid. I was the right place at the right time.